Have you ever wondered what it would be like if a walking red flag became sentient and tried to write its own book? Have you ever wondered, hmm, I wonder what that book would sound like? I wonder what words it would use? Guess what? You don't have to wonder today because we are going to be reviewing a book by such a person. Dan Price, former CEO of Gravity Payments, is a sentient walking red flag if there ever was one. This past Friday on my channel, we talked about Dan Price's resignation from the company Gravity Payments that he founded about 15 years ago. And before that, a couple months ago, we talked about some of the red flags that had been appearing about this man for a very long time. Dan Price first rose to fame back in 2015 when, as the CEO of Gravity Payments, he made the decision to raise the minimum salary for all of his employees to $70,000 a year, which resulted in him taking a cut of his own pay as a CEO. And this wasn't something that we saw a lot of CEOs doing at the time. A lot of CEOs wanted to make extra money wanted to get their bonuses, were willing to, you know, make themselves richer and richer at the expense of their own employees. As a result, he became somewhat of a hero in the CEO world. He became the one CEO that leftist Twitter said was not like other CEOs. He became a CEO that even Bernie Sanders seemed cool with. But while that decision may have made financial sense and may have made people's lives better financially, we saw that there were a lot of other controversies he was involved in, specifically surrounding his treatment of of women, the way that he targeted women, and his accusations of abuse and SA from women whom he had been romantically involved with, including his ex-wife. As more of those accusations have piled up, Dan Price announced just a couple weeks ago that he was stepping down from his position as CEO of Gravity Payments in order to focus on, in his words, fighting these false accusations. We're currently in a he said, she said bullshit type of world right now, so I can't definitively say what has or has not happened, but I can review his book and review review what Dan Price himself has specifically said. Today we are going to be reviewing the book Worth It, How a Million Dollar Pay Cut and a $70,000 Minimum Wage Revealed a Better Way of Doing Business by Dan Price, CEO of Gravity Payments. Not anymore, but he was when he first wrote this book. The book, even on the back of it, has a quote from Bernie Sanders that says, At a time of massive wealth and income inequality in our country, Mr. Price sets an example that other companies should learn from. He even includes a quote of criticism from Rush Limbaugh, who says, Pure unadulterated socialism. I hope this company is a case study in MBA programs on how socialism does not work because it's gonna fail. Well, the company succeeded, but Dan Price himself has failed solely due to his own hubris. So let's talk about all of that in today's book review. Get you some nuts. There was lots of memes. Makes me wonder if I should take up lesbianism. Chicago. You guys asked for it. What's up my fellow small business supporters? I'm Savvy, welcome back to Savvy Writes Books, the channel where we talk about books and business, where today I have another book review for you guys written by someone who once owned a business. So we've got a little bit of everything today. If you're new here, please don't forget to subscribe to this channel where three times a week I put out new videos all about books and business, which you won't want to miss on this channel. Although next week we'll probably only have two videos because it's gonna be my 30th birthday and I wanna be busy celebrating, but maybe I'll do like a live stream or something. I don't know, we'll figure it out. We'll have a good time. Party on, Wayne! Party on, Garth. But today we've got a book review for you guys. So don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to ring the notification bell. And if you like listening to me talk about all these topics, then don't forget to check out my second channel, Your Morning Guru, linked in the description below as well, where every weekday morning at 7 a.m. Central Time, my friend and I host a morning show where we talk about similar topics, books, business. We have a book club where we review books together. We discuss business gurus and live like them and see what we can learn from them. And that is gonna be one of the themes of today's video. What can we learn from the failures of Dan Price? Because I will be the first to say right now that after making two videos on Dan Price, the allegations against him, the ways that women have alleged he has treated them, I will say that Dan Price is not somebody I support. He's not somebody I think you should support. He is not somebody that I think is a good person. He's not somebody that I think we should promote or support financially. However, I do think he is a person we can all learn from. And whether that's learning how to do business, how not to do business, how to write a book, how not to write a book, I want to go through this book today and see what we can learn from it, both in terms of the writing of the book itself and which parts work, which parts don't work, and also into looking at this book with somewhat of a critical 
the lens because I think there are some places where he may not be telling the complete truth. So let's just go through the book and let's talk about it. Chapter one of this book is called The Hike and it is Dan Price telling the story of how back in, I wanna say 2014 or 2015, he went on a hike with one of his friends and talked to that friend about some of the financial difficulties that she was having. At this point, Gravity Payments was already doing very well. It was already a successful company. And while he was on the hike with this friend, he was learning that his friend was working just as hard as he was. She was working just as many hours, if not more. She was struggling because she was also raising a child and had all of these other barriers in her way. And he was wondering, why is she only making $40,000 a year when I'm bringing in a seven figure salary? Why is that happening? And according to him, from his perspective, this was what first got him to thinking about raising all of his employees' salaries. She wasn't one of his employees, but she was someone making $40,000 a year. It reminded him of this study by Daniel Kahneman and Angus Deaton, who were two psychologists that found that if you raised people's income up to about $75,000 a year for most parts of the US on average, that was going to be the point at which money no longer equaled happiness. So people say all the time money can't buy happiness. It was found that money up to about $75,000 a year at this point in time for this rate of inflation in the US on average, that that amount of money actually does buy happiness because you're able to focus on things that make you happy, spending time with your family, your own personal goals, hobbies, and things like that, when that amount of money can cover your basic necessities, can cover your mortgage payments, your food, things like that. Because when you have less money than that, generally you're going to be thinking really hard about having to cover your own personal expenses a lot. And it's going to be a lot harder to focus on things that make you happy. So that was basically what this study had said. It circulated a lot at this time. And Dan Price basically was saying, okay, well, based on this study and based on the fact that my friend is stressed out a lot while making less than that, maybe if I raised all of my employees' salaries to around that level, maybe they would be happier. And maybe they would then have some of that stress taken away from them. They would be able to focus more on their work as a result. He says on page five, how can I justify paying an employee less than what Valerie was making when those people were willing to cancel a Friday night date or work through a holiday to help our clients? Every day I paid them less than they needed to be financially secure, even though I could have afforded to pay them more, I was actively chipping away at the well-being of my team. How was that productive? How could I let this stand? In April 2015, just after that hike with Valerie, I announced my decision to implement a $70,000 minimum annual wage at our company Gravity Payments. The announcement created a media frenzy I had no way of anticipating, and I suddenly found myself at the center of a larger conversation about whether businesses have a responsibility to pay their workers a living wage. So a couple things going on on this page. First of all, I find it a little bit hard to believe that a man who was this successful in business took until he was 30 years old to come to the groundbreaking conclusion that some some people made less money than him through no fault of their own. He seems very intentionally ignorant, like, wow, I just had no idea. And based on, if you guys saw the video that I made where I dissected the 2015 Bloomberg article about him that I made a couple months ago, that article basically said that Lucas basically claimed, no, this whole hike with his friend story was absolute bullshit. He didn't raise people's income in the company based on feeling bad for one of his friends that he thought other people should get to live a better life because he had some kind of come to Jesus moment that no, in fact, it was because I, his brother Lucas, was suing him because he was paying himself over a million dollars, which for the CEO of a company of our current size, he was making a lot more than the average CEO was. He was giving himself bonuses. He was paying himself too much. I was suing him for that. And he decided he could spin that as, oh, hey, look, I actually decided on my own goodwill to take a pay cut so that everyone else could get a higher salary. So those are two sides to the story. Again, I can't read people's minds. I don't know what goes on behind closed doors in the boardroom meetings, so I cannot tell you for certain what happened. But I will just say that what Dan has written here is contested. It is not confirmed necessarily to be true. <laughs> That along with the part where he says the announcement created a media frenzy I had no way of anticipating. A lot of this book we're gonna go into, Dan is very into making himself look like someone who never wanted the attention. He truly was just doing this to make people's lives better and to make the company better. But again, according to the lawsuit by his brother, it seems that maybe Dan Price did want this media frenzy. Maybe he was intentionally doing this for attention for the company. I can't claim to know anyone's motivations, but just when reading through this, if you choose to read this book, which I don't recommend because I 
don't want to financially support him. Although the book was published by Gravity Payments, the, his own company, which he is no longer running. So maybe he, I don't know, he'll probably still get an author royalty. Don't support Dan Price. Just, just watch this book review instead, okay? He has a section in this book where I agree with the words that he's writing. And I think this is one of the situations where throughout this book, I'm going to point out things where I say, you know, I like what he wrote here. And I agree that if we adopt this mindset, we can go farther in business. Or if we adopt this mindset, when it comes to writing a business book, this will make for better books. So there are some places where I'm going to be giving it compliments, but that's not necessarily to say that I necessarily agree that what he's saying is true from his own perspective or that I believe that he meant this or that he actually had this idea in his heart. It's more so to say that the actual tangible thing that happened, I think we can learn from his readers, which is why I want to point these things out. On page 11, he says, the idea that it's not personal, it's business is no longer valid. Business is personal. It is a human invention that along the way has lost its humanity. When we separate our personal values from our professional ones, we give up one of the most powerful tools at our disposal to affect real change. And I completely agree with this. I think that is a really important quote to take to heart. I wish it weren't said by him because I don't believe you. If you guys remember last week's video, I pulled up one of the tweets that he had in the past where he would say things like, the idea that after watching a president like Trump go on this crazy tirade, the idea that anyone could ever say a woman is too emotional to be president, I don't ever want to hear that kind of thing again. Basically saying this whole like, let's debunk stereotypes about women, let's be supportive of women. And then it was basically exposed by one of his former romantic partners. She would claim that he used to try to like monitor her pulse because if her heart rate was higher than his, he would say that he was more rational than her and then he would use that as a way to manipulate her into doing what he wanted. So he absolutely has a lot of abuse allegations against him. So that was an example of how he often says one thing and then does the complete opposite in practice. So he has this whole idea in this book of like, we can't separate our personal values from the values of our business. I don't necessarily believe that he truly believes that. But at the same time, I do think that is a thing that we as the audience can believe and can agree with, right? So he says here, on that same page, page 11, he says, my decision to pay a base salary of $70,000 a year at Gravity resulted from my lifelong journey to understand my purpose in the world. Again, that's contested. It might have resulted from the lawsuit that his brother filed against him, which is confirmed that that lawsuit came before the $70,000 pay increase. So I don't know. And then he gets a little bit of a martyr complex toward the bottom of page 11, where he says, I was willing to take this risk even if it meant losing everything. And I was like, dude, okay, paying yourself over a million dollars to be the CEO of this company. You were paying yourself much higher than the average CEO of a company of your size was getting paid. You were willing to take the risk of cutting your own salary to a livable wage to give other people a livable wage, even if it meant losing everything. If it meant losing what? It would mean your company would look better and you would still be paying yourself a living wage. In what way would you be losing everything? Again, it just makes it feel like he's trying to have this like martyr complex is making himself out to be the victim in this situation. I wanna talk a little bit about Dan Price's past. I would never blame someone for what happened during their childhood or what their parents were like, but I do think the way that he talks about his father and his father's dealings in business does say a lot. Now there was a really interesting thread throughout this book where Dan Price talks about his own time growing up in an extremely Christian family where everything was about religion and was about Jesus and how later he kind of had his own deconstruction from the Christian faith. And I find that interesting to always read about people getting away from certain religious beliefs that had permeated their lives so strongly for a long time. So it does become clear later that Dan Price does eventually lose some of the idolization he used to have for his father and that towards the beginning of the book on page 16 when he's talking about his father in a positive way that's more his interpretation interpretation as a child, whereas as an adult, he comes to see some of his dad's own flaws in business. So I will say that there is some balanced writing there in showing how his idolization of his dad may have been misplaced when he was younger, which I think is a thing that a lot of young people can absolutely relate to. But I also think it's important to point out what his dad was doing business-wise. So in the video I made a couple months ago, first going into Dan Price, his father, Ron Price, was the former president of AIM International, which was a huge MLM multi-level marketing company. It's not one that we've often, that I don't think I've ever outside of Dan Price have talked about on my channel, and it's not one that we often hear talked about in the anti-MLM world, but it was an MLM company, which this book even admits. So on page 16, it says, my dad always felt an obligation to provide for his family. After working at Shiloh for nine years and fathering the first four of what would eventually be six children, he felt the need to do something different. After months of prayer and fasting with the church's encouragement and support, he and my mom moved our family to Milwaukee. The goal was to plant a new church, 
but this never worked out. Instead, his career took a turn after my mom became interested in a green juice product that was sold through direct sales. While he was initially skeptical about the way the product was sold, he was impressed by how many customers touted the juice's benefits and decided to join my mom in a home-based business. What my dad lacked in experience or training, he made up for with his supernatural drive. He believed that while you might not be as smart, rich, or qualified as someone else, you could always outwork the competition. He worked long hours building his client list and soon began moving up the ranks of the company. The juice company employed a dubious multi-level marketing strategy, so his job involved both selling products to customers and recruiting customers to sell more product. My dad's work ethic earned him the modest success in both areas, but where he really shined was in public speaking. So we're on page 17. Thanks to his acting background, he was an incredible presenter who could hold your attention on any subject from the Bible to the benefits of organic juice. The company leadership quickly noticed his skills and moved him to their headquarters in Idaho. There, he gave training seminars to new salespeople and continued to climb the corporate ladder. After a decade of service, he became president of the company. The hard work paid off, giving my parents the opportunity to support our growing family. I want to say that while this is Dan reflecting on what his dad was like during his childhood, and then later in the book, he does come to the conclusion that his dad wasn't quite the superhero that he previously saw him as, and that they had very different views on business and what was ethical. This entire section really is written as if this is the lesson that Dan wants us to take from this, so I do want to break down some of what's going on in this section. So first of all, throughout this book, it's clear that Dan has a lot of family help in starting up his business, which there's no issue with that. If you have family connections in the business you want to start, his dad later does go into credit card processing, and then Dan and his brother Lucas, when they're teenagers, start this gravity payments credit card processing company with the help of their father, who is able to kind of connect them with clients and kind of help them understand how the credit card processing world works when you're that young and things like that. So he does end up getting a lot of help from his dad and the way that his dad made this money for the family was through exploiting thousands of people in an MLM. So that is a little shady, but then again, I can't say that that's Dan's fault because it's not really right to necessarily say, okay, if you took any help from your parents and your parents had help from their parents and then you go all the way back in your family tree up to your ancestors who exploited anyone back in the day, right? Like none of us is completely free of sin if we're going to go that far back in the pipeline. Jesus this, Moses that. Abraham hit me with a wiffle ball bat. However, I just want to talk about the way he wrote this here. So it says here, while he was initially skeptical about the way the product was sold, he was impressed by how many customers touted the juice's benefits. So I wrote there, it was kind of like a fake it till you make it type of thing, especially since the following sentence is what my dad lacked in experience or training he made up for with his supernatural drive. So even though the father himself was skeptical of the business model, he was out here being like, yeah, but everyone likes the benefits of it. And I have this drive to be able to sell it to people. So he did kind of a fake it till you make it type of business, which again is a little sus. And then it later says, thanks to his acting background, he was an incredible presenter who could hold your attention. Earlier in the book, it talks about how Ron Price, Dan's father, used to be very into acting and performing. And that's just such a common thing we see with a lot of MLM gurus, right? We talk about Rachel Hollis a million times on this channel. In her book, she constantly talks about how she did theater in high school. She was president of the drama club when she left home to go to LA at 17. Her goal was originally to be an actor. That's what she wanted to do. She had the acting background. We talked about Gabby Bernstein, another MLM business guru who loves to tout the benefits of network marketing even when it's exploitative. She studied theater at Syracuse, so she had an acting background. Basically, it seems like almost every one of these gurus had some kind of acting background. And then we're seeing with Dan Price's father, Ron, it's he had an acting background. And because of that, he was able to convince any one of the benefits of these juice products. Parents, you're the cause of all my... What you're calling acting, I might be calling lying. It's lying. If you're acting to, to sell someone something real where you're really trying to part them with their money, that's not acting, that's just lying, but okay. So this part here also kind of bothered me with on page 17 where it said after a decade of service, he became president of the company. The hard work paid off, giving my parents the opportunity to support our growing family. I wrote, no, the hard work didn't pay off. The MLM exploitation paid off. Dan even admitted that his father had to recruit new people to sell within the company. They didn't make money just through the sheer force of hard work. They made money because they exploited other people. And again, I'm not blaming Dan himself for that, but I do think if you're going to present this section in the thing of like, my dad's hard work paid off, you do need 
need to be a little more specific of like talking about that being exploitation of other people. Like it would just be weird. Just imagine if he'd written it like this and it had been like, my dad used to be a phone scammer who called up elderly people to give them hit their credit card numbers and then he'd rob them. His hard work paid off. You could still say, you know, back then I idolized my father and didn't realize that what he was doing was wrong. And I still learned a lot about business from him, but I can, I can in retrospect be critical of what he was doing. You would need to at least to some extent acknowledge that that was scamming and exploiting people, which there is really no acknowledgement of here, and I find that to be a massive red flag. Then on page 20, Dan starts talking about how his dad was obsessed with Stephen Covey and the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. That's a book that we did read for your Morning Guru book club, I think back in January. I still need to review that book on this channel. And what's interesting is that Stephen Covey, the guy who wrote The Seven Habits, was very Mormon and originally wrote it based on like Mormon principles. And he would say, you know, this book isn't meant to be Mormon, it's meant to be applied to everything, but it still did have a lot of Mormon influence in it, and we'll talk about that on this channel. Just like in Dan Price's family of six kids, Stephen Covey had nine kids and I believe like 55 grandkids. They did the Mormons being fruitful and multiplying thing. Although it says on page 20 here, my dad was especially fond of Covey's fourth habit, Think Win Win, which advises you to try to figure out a solution or deal that will work for all parties involved rather than only getting the best deal for yourself. And I will say that when I read The Seven Habits, I thought that this habit was written pretty well in the book. I did think that it was explained pretty well. Although later we'll see that some of the places where Dan applies this habit doesn't always necessarily work. However, it is a little hypocritical the way that he describes this later on the page where he said, my dad took this concept even further, explaining to us that there was no such thing as a win-lose deal, only win-win and lose-lose deals. If you tried to pull one over on your customers, you might gain something in the short term, but your dishonesty would come back to haunt you and both sides would eventually suffer. And while I agree with that sentiment in principle and on the surface, it's a little hypocritical that Dan's father was the one trying to instill this value in him when just a couple pages ago we saw that he recruited people into this weird green juicing MLM and worked as president of the company for, I believe, over 10 years. He spent a decade as president of that company. I don't know where he gets off saying the only deals are win-win or lose-lose deals. It needs to work for all parties involved when he was actively scamming people in a green juice MLM company. In what universe is that a win-win deal? He was probably trying to convince all his customers that these were win-win deals, but in reality, it wasn't honest. It was a completely dishonest way of doing business. On page 32, Dan starts talking about his family first getting into the whole credit card processing world. So he talks about his dad and he said who by this point had left his job at the juice company and was consulting in the credit card industry. So he had someone he could learn from. He had his dad as a mentor, although his dad was doing business in a dishonest way with the MLM. So I'm not quite sure how good of a mentor he was. However, one thing I will say that I appreciate about this book that is well written. And again, I don't trust Dan Price. I don't trust that he's not a fucking liar based on all of the allegations against him from women and based on him being a horrible person. So I just want to preface this by saying he could be lying out of his ass for this entire thing. But I will say in terms of business book writing, I appreciate how this is written. So if you're out there and you're like, I kind of want to write a business book, I think you can learn from the way that he does this, where he talks about how one of his favorite coffee shops in his hometown, he was struggling, the coffee shop was struggling. And when he went and talked to the owner, Heather, he looked at her credit card processing statement and saw the company that was processing her credit card was taking all of these fees from her and was charging her all this extra money. And he showed it to his dad and was like, can we work on a solution for this? What if a company could process credit cards in a way that wouldn't quite do this? And so it says on page 32, with the help of my dad, I did some research and returned to Heather's shop several days later. Together, we called the credit card processing company. And after a few minutes on the phone, we were able to negotiate a lower rate and save her a few hundred dollars per month. So do I believe that this story necessarily really happened based on the fact that Dan Price may be a massive liar? No. But do I appreciate the way the story is written? Yes. And that is because he talks about what specifically first got him into this business. He's honest about the fact that his dad was involved in credit card processing. He doesn't say, I had no connections. I didn't know anybody in this business. I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. Like for example, there's that whole chapter in Girl, Wash Your Face where Rachel Hollis starts it off being like, I had absolutely no connections. Here's a celebrity story. That wasn't my story, lol. I had no connections. And then you later find out that her dad was this preacher who wrote all these self-help books too and that she married into a Disney executive 
level of money and connections. And Dan Price is fairly upfront about like, yes, I had my dad help me out with this because I was a teenager when this happened and he walked me through this process. So he's upfront about that. Do I think he's being honest necessarily? No, but I do appreciate that the story has detail. So coming from a writing perspective, I think it's good that he can point to a specific story and say, this is how my family helped me. This is what happened in the interaction. This was my first foray into credit card processing was this story. What I'm saying is that this book has actual scenes actually breaking down what happened in these circumstances and a lot of business books are lacking that extremely basic component of being a book. And while that is extremely basic, I'm glad to see it here and I'll point out a few other places where he does this as well. So again, that's not to say believe that this really happened, but it is to say if you're gonna write a business book, write it more in this style than in the girl wash your face type of style. On page 53, the book, th this is this is where I'm, I'm getting a little torn again because the book does talk about some of the ways that Gravity Payments did sort of exploit employees in the past during their early days before Dan Price raised the salary of all the employees up to 70 thousand dollars a year so I don't want to go off on him and be like this was awful that you were exploiting people in the first place because obviously he knows that and changed his company for the better which is exactly what we want business owners to do is to change the company for the better however I do think it leads into a discussion about what makes a business successful and about just general business ethics so let's look at page 53 he talks about initially we hired friends and family to help out on a part-time basis but by my second year of college we were able to hire our first employees we started hiring in an unsophisticated way. Every time we would hit $2,000 per month in profit, I would hire somebody at $24,000 a year with no benefits, putting our profit back at zero. The first full-time salaried employee I ever hired was David Meisner, who replied to our job posting on Craigslist. Technically, he was hired to help develop our sales process, but in those early days, we all wore many hats. I know he didn't take the job for the salary, the benefits, or the swanky office. His salary was less than half the median household income in Seattle at the time, but he never complained and, true to his intent, became integral to our early development. David still works at Gravity, making a solid six figure your income. I wish I could have done better for him earlier. I wish I could have given him things like health care and a 401k. He definitely deserved them, but we simply could not afford it at the time. And I'm like, this is a place where it's like, yeah, it's good that you're saying I wish we could have done that. But it's like, if you couldn't afford those things, you just couldn't afford him. If you're hiring someone with a full time salary, and I don't want to be like too judgmental here, because I definitely don't think there's anything wrong with hiring someone part time or hiring someone for contract work where those things don't necessitate benefits and 401k and all of that. But if you're hiring someone for full time, work, if you're expecting him to work 40 hours a week, that means that it's not reasonable to expect him to be able to work any other job on top of that. So you're taking up the entirety of his working hours and not paying him enough to survive on, even though all of the reasonable amount of hours he should be working are being taken up. So it did seem like there was a lack of reflection there, even though he says he regrets it and eventually did change what the company was doing. I think this is the thing a lot of times that businesses don't get. And this is a criticism that you can aim at small businesses, large businesses, businesses of any size. If you say, I wish I could hire you and pay you more but I can't afford it at some point you might just realize you just can't afford that person you just can't afford to do this thing I wish I could switch places with you for just one day there have been times that I've had to put this into practice and trust me I'm not perfect I've made tons of mistakes as a business owner that maybe in a different video I'll break down and go into I have plenty of regrets of things I've done wrong in starting a business as well but I think that that's a thing that a lot of people forget sometimes where it's like okay I want to do this initiative but I can't afford to do it for this much so instead I won't pay people as much and I'll cut things here and cut things there. It's like, it's possible you just can't afford to do that thing. Make more fucking money. This is America. You don't make money. You're a fucking douchebag. Now what you It's possible that that thing, you, you just can't afford to do it yet. When you're starting your own business, that's a risk you take on. The idea that like, because you are starting it, because you have ownership of this company, you then bear all the responsibility of if I can't afford to pay someone else to do this and pay them what they deserve, either I have to pay myself less or I just have to do more of the work myself. That's just kind of what happens. I've, I've been there before. I've had to do all the work myself before because I couldn't afford to pay someone the right amount. And if you're hiring someone for full-time work, meaning 35 plus hours a week, probably more than 40 since it does say in here that he wore many hats, that he was hired to develop sales processes, but he was also doing a lot more that was outside of his job description. I'm worried that this man wasn't being paid for the actual amount of hours that he worked. 
And there is a lack of discussion on the overall ethics of that that I think really is missing from this book, especially if it is a book about the importance of paying people well and all of that. I will say something positive again on page 64. I think the writing of this book, again, did a good job at being very specific about the stories that happened and about how the business was built. I've talked so many times before when I review business books on this channel that one of the biggest critiques I have of so many business books is that they skip over all of the initial building of the business. It starts with, I had this brilliant idea and I struggled to nail down the mission statement. Let's let's go all the way back to square zero and talk about that. And then let's jump all the way forward to now we have some customers. Now we have some employees and there isn't a lot of talk about how you got there. I do really appreciate that this book goes into specifics, breaks things down into scenes and isn't just motivational fluff. I do appreciate that. On page 64, he's talking about one of the early clients that Gravity Payments got, which was a fast food restaurant, I believe, called Taco Time. And he says, the owners cut me a series of checks totaling approximately $60,000 in order to buy all the equipment needed for my plan. It was the largest payment Gravity had ever received. I walk out the door and got to work. We never had a client nearly as big or a task this massive before, but these owners had given me money and I had given them a promise. I called the team on the car ride back to the office and let them know about Taco Time's decision and the work we had in front of us. We now had to install equipment in 75 restaurants from Oregon to the Canadian border in just a few days. Personal plans were canceled, celebrations were abandoned, we stopped all normal operations, employees brought in family members, spouses, and friends to help. Overnight, we doubled our staff to a ragtag group of 25. First of all, I want to say I appreciate the specifics of the story. I appreciate that he says how much money the deal was for. He talks about how the struggles they were having with the equipment. On the previous page, he talks about the initial pitch meeting that he had with this company. So in terms of the writing for the business book itself, excellent. Highly recommend that if you're out there wanting to write a business book, you break it down just as specific. However, there is also a massive red flag. And this is something that we talked about when we talked about Ben Shapiro's book, The Authoritarian Moment, back in January. When we talked in that video about that book, one of the things we talked about was using passive participle verb phrases. These are not necessarily grammatically incorrect. There is nothing necessarily immoral about using them. But when you write in this way, it often calls into question who is exactly responsible for everything. So for example, we have in here, and so for example, in Ben Shapiro's book, when we talked about that, he would talk about how the authoritarian left is a big enemy we need to look out for. And he would say things like, anyone who doesn't conform must be silenced. And the phrase must be silenced, it's like, okay, who's what's the subject of must be silenced? You have a verb in passive participle, form. So they must be silenced by whom? Who is the subject? And so you can see when Ben Shapiro does that, it's kind of a way of taking away the subject of the sentence, not providing any specific accusation that you can then go and fact check, but rather using a fear mongering tactic to use this powerful verb phrase that makes you afraid without ever telling you what specifically to look out for so that you can go and do further research on your own. We have a little bit of that here too. So on the previous page, when he's talking about the pitch meeting he has with Taco Time, it's like Christmas time and he's the Taco Time employees are worried that people are going to have to cancel their own Christmas plans with their family. And then when Dan talks about getting people involved with the company to work on these issues for the clients, that the client doesn't have to have these issues, he uses those passive participle verb phrases the same way that Ben Shapiro does, where he says things like personal plans were canceled, celebrations were were abandoned. Who did that? Do you mean your employees? Your employees had to cancel their personal plans? Or Dan, do you mean that you canceled your personal plans? Basically, Dan is leaving it so that you can interpret it as, oh, look, I abandoned all of my personal plans. I canceled my own Christmas because I cared so much about the company. But he doesn't say I canceled my own personal plans. He says personal plans were canceled. Does that mean that your employees had to cancel their own personal plans too? Does it mean that you canceled your employees' personal plans for them? Does it mean that you intentionally took your employees away from being able to spend Christmas with their own families? The writing is a little shady and I wish he'd been a little more specific there because I'd love to be able to critique exactly what happened, but he's leaving a little bit too much room for interpretation there, which I don't really appreciate. He then says, employees brought in family members, spouses, and friends to help. And I was like, were they paid? Did they bring in these, these people who didn't work for your company to help out? Did you pay these people or no? Were you, were you expecting that your employees were gonna get their own family members involved to spend Christmas working on this project for their job that ultimately benefits you and your company? Why are they invested in the success of your company? This is a job to them. So again, I'm like, okay. Uh, uh, 
that's really shady. Page 65, there's at least a little bit of reflection on this, which I appreciate. But on this page, he says, in that moment, I thought back to how David Meisner had cultivated the opportunity with Taco Time in the first place. It would have been easy for him to just fill out the complaint form. Instead, he exhibited the initiative that not only helped Taco Time, but Gravity too. It was a win-win scenario, the type of deal my dad had taught me to make. I was proud of all the sacrifices we had made to do this job. I was proud we had canceled vacations. I was proud we had forfeited our plans. Instead, we would help our clients. And I was like, okay, it was a win-win, but not for the staff. Staff, it was a win-win for the client and for you and for your company, but it wasn't necessarily a win for your staff. Win, win, win. He does have some reflection on this though, which from the writing perspective, I do appreciate where he says, later I would realize the harm this philosophy was inflicting on my team, being asked to surrender precious personal time in order to help a company that was not paying them anything close to the salaries they deserve. So I do appreciate that he has reflection on that and that he did actually change that method, regardless of whether his intentions were good or regardless of whether he is a good person. I think that that's still something that business owners out there can learn from in a positive way. Similarly, on page 96, I think he also had some good acknowledgments of his flaws and reflection on what he as a business owner could have done better. He says, I told myself that if my people were unhappy, they could always leave. Without realizing it, I'd adopted the classic market-driven thinking that a business was only responsible for paying employees enough to stay competitive. Anything less than that, and they would leave for a higher paying gig. Anything more, and I was not upholding my responsibility to maximize profit and minimize expenses. If someone wanted to be paid more, they needed to either take on a new role that would force me to pay them more or look elsewhere for a competing offer. So he's talking about how he was wrong in this case, right? The writing is from this perspective of like, this is what was in my mind at the time. And then he even says there without realizing it, I'd adopted the classic market driven thinking that a business was only responsible. And he goes on like that there, right? So he's talking about how he'd adopted this business mindset and he'd gotten stuck in this pattern of thinking like many CEOs do and how he now has learned from that. So I thought that was a good use of reflection in the writing. Similar thing happens on page 100. And this reminded me of a similar time when I'd done a flaw in business once that I'll briefly talk about here. So on page 100, he says he's talking about one of his employees named Rosita, who while working at Gravity, she enjoyed working there, but she was considering working as a manager at McDonald's as well because she wasn't making enough money to get by and she needed the benefits. So this is one of those cases where Dan starts to learn, okay, this isn't right. I'm not paying my employees enough. I need to be able to benefit them. So he says in 2011, while discussing my pay policies with others, I remembered Rosita's situation and realized what was bothering me. Without noticing, I had slipped into the business mold I had told myself I was trying to avoid. I had started Gravity with a mission to do something different, to rock the foundation of an industry that wasn't working as efficiently or as responsibly as it could. It paved my own path in the credit card processing industry, refusing to accept a given way of doing business just because it was the way things were done. And yet here I was, justifying low salaries by pointing to the status quo. Now, while I'm skeptical of Dan Price himself, I think this was a good moment of reflection because I myself have had a very similar experience to this, which I will now confess to you guys. I am not a perfect business owner, as you guys know. I try to talk about business ethics on this channel, but that's another way for me to reflect on things myself. And this wasn't a time when I was owning my own business, but I just, the way he wrote about this, where he said, I tried to justify this to myself at the time by thinking of the status quo, by thinking of the way things are done. I had a moment like this once, which is something I really regret. And I'm not gonna go into specifics here because this was when I was working for somebody else and I don't wanna give away any details of anything. I've worked a lot of editing jobs in the past. I've done a lot of freelance editing and I've worked a lot of editing for various publishers and things like that. So at one point I was working on this editing gig for a publisher and I was supposed to get these edits back to this author. And at the end of the day, the publisher decided not to give the author the contract. And originally when my boss had asked me, hey Savvy, can you shoot over the email to the author that you're editing for and let him know that we've decided not to go with him. And I remembered I had to do that, but then I kind of put it on the back of my list. And the reason I put it on the back of my list, this is so stupid and this is a thing that I regret. So guys know that I, I don't condone this at all. One of the reasons was that around this time I myself had been querying publishers as an author. I had been pitching my own books to editors and to publishers and sometimes it would take an editor six months or a year to get back to me. Sometimes they'd never get back to me at all and the industry standard was if an editor or publisher never gets back to you just assume you don't have the contract and move on. So even though we had been in contact with this person and had been considering it previously I was supposed to let him know no we're not actually going to go ahead with this and I put it on the back burner because in my mind I'm like okay 
okay, I've got a million other things that need to get done first. And the industry standard, the status quo, is that as an author, you can't really expect to be told that right away. So I'll reach out to him and I'll let him know that, but let me tend to these other things first. I ended up getting back to him really late and I felt really bad about that. But in my mind, I was like, those are the way things are done. So my boss eventually is like, Savvy, why did you take so long to get back to him? And I was like, well, you know, I had all these other things I had to get done that were on my plate. And I figured he would assume being an author who's querying that it might take a long time for someone to get back to you. And my boss was like, yeah, but that's not friendly to do to authors. And I was like, yeah, but authors all expect that. I expect that when I'm querying an editor. And she's like, yeah, but just because that's the way things are done doesn't mean that that's the way you should do things. And that's when I was like, wow, I really fucked up. I feel so bad. So if that dude is out there, I'm really sorry about that, by the way. But that was an example where I learned that like, yeah, sometimes when you're working on the other side of something, when there's a status quo within business that isn't friendly to people, whether that's to clients or employees or whatever, sometimes because we're all just on autopilot going through our days, we can all fall into that trap as well. I fell into that trap in that moment and it's something that I still regret even though this was many, many years ago at this point. But it's something I still regret because I'm like, that wasn't a valid excuse. Why did I just like not care about that person's feelings in that moment? That was an absolutely shitty thing of me to do. So that this is another case like that where it was like, okay, this was the way things are done and I was able to justify this action to myself that was beneficial to me but not to somebody else by saying that's the way things are done. I appreciated that reflection in this book and maybe I'll reflect on that in a book that I write in the future because man, that wasn't right of me. And I'm really sorry. <laughs> I'm really sorry to anyone I've ever hurt in my naivety in the past. As we've talked about in previous weeks when talking about Dan Price, we know that he and his older brother Lucas who founded the company together, that they had a lot of tension over the years, which ultimately resulted in a lawsuit that Lucas filed against Dan. And I just thought the characterization of Lucas in this book was very weird. So on page 102, a few years earlier in 2008, Lucas had finally decided to let me buy out his equal share in the company. We agreed to a restriction and the company redeemed enough of his shares to give me about two thirds ownership. We'd grown significantly and this move resulted in a payout to Lucas of $400,000, which he used to travel the world with his wife. In 2012, Lucas and his wife decided to start a family, so they returned to Seattle. So I thought that that was like a weird characterization being like, so he took the money and he used it to travel the world with his wife, okay? Like he, he spent that money. I don't know, I just thought it was a weird characterization. And then on page 103, it said, when Lucas started to criticize how I was compensating employees, our disagreements deepened. So this is, around the time that Dan is increasing employees' salaries to $70,000 a year, and because Lucas had basically gone on the record saying, Dan did not increase these salaries because he genuinely wanted to help employees, he did it because I was suing him. And meanwhile, Dan's over here like, my brother's only suing me because he didn't like that I was compensating employees better. So that's been a fight between them for a long time. And on page 103, he's kind of making it sound like, Lucas didn't like that I was paying people more. Lucas was just a greedy Mr. Scrooge over here. Our falling out was hard on me. I loved Lucas and wanted to be able to spend time with him without arguing about the company. I received a tie-breaking vote in almost any board decision since I was the majority shareholder, so I could have easily gotten my way, but I hated the idea that we couldn't come to a compromise. So this was just another place where he kind of puts the martyr role on himself, where he's like, okay, I had more shares of the company. And the reason I had more shares of the company is that I paid Lucas out of the company and he traveled the world with his wife and he gladly took that. So I could have just voted him out at any point, but I didn't want to because I'm a good brother who legitimately loves him and wanted to come to an agreement. It just seems very one-sided. It makes me wonder like, what would Lucas say about this? And I'm not saying that Lu maybe Lucas is a terrible guy. Maybe Dan and Lucas are both terrible guys. They probably are based on what we're reading here. But it just seems like a weird characterization that makes me go like, hmm, what's, what's Lucas's side of the story exactly? On page 111, he says, when Lucas and I had renegotiated my salary in 2012, we agreed on an $800,000 bonus for me. So along with my $300,000 salary, I made $1.1 million in cash that year. We kept the same arrangement in 2013 and 2014. So first of all, once again, Lucas has a different side to the story where if you read within the lawsuits and such, Lucas talks about how he, no, did not agree to that. He in fact thought Dan was paying himself way too much. And second of all, why would Dan give himself an $800,000 bonus? Why wouldn't he give that to the employees? He later talks about about caring so much about the employees. If you know that your company has 800,000 extra dollars, why would you give that just to yourself? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense why he even wanted to take that for himself in the first place. Cause he talks about how when he raised his employees salaries, he cut his own salary to $70,000 as well. And it's like, bro, there's so much middle ground between $70,000 and over a million. You had 800,000 extra dollars. Like you just took that without a second thought. I don't know. It's very weird to me. Feels like a red flag. I do think it's funny on page 141 where after 
Dan Price raises everyone's salary to $70,000, the way that Rush Limbaugh reacts to this on the radio. He says, Rush lambasted my decision. He assured his fans that gravity would fail and become a high profile example of how to destroy a successful company. This is pure unadulterated socialism, which has never worked, he said. That's why I hope this company is a case study in MBA programs on how socialism does not work because it's gonna fail and it isn't gonna take long because once everyone figures out they're all making the same no matter what they do, the slackers are gonna surface human nature. And I was just like, I just wrote in the margin, let's play conservatives try to define socialism. <laughs> there's, there's no socialism involved here. First of all, not every employee was getting paid exactly the same. It's just that people were getting paid a minimum of $70,000. The way the company ran actually was fairly effective until Dan Price decided to be a full on douche canoe. Then it gets into the lawsuit between him and Lucas on page 146. And I appreciate that Dan is confronting it head on and isn't shying away from it. But again, the characterization of Lucas is very weird. Dan putting himself in the protagonist role a lot. So he says, at this point, there was not much Lucas could do to get his way. Thanks to the deal we had struck in 2008, I had majority control of the company and could outvote him on most types of decisions. So Lucas set out to take me down. As I found out later, he created a list of things he could do to put me in a bad position. On his list were these items, negatively affect Dan's reputation, take credit for gravity payment success, make employees question Dan's loyalty, make family question Dan's cruelty, kiss the ring, steal the home. In early 2014, for the first time ever, Lucas voted against my total compensation for 2013, even though the company had grown over the previous year and I was not seeking a raise. So first of all, I'm like, why do you care if Lucas doesn't want you to make your $800,000 bonus because later you talk about how that was wrong anyway. Second of all, this whole list of like negatively affect Dan's reputation. It's like my to-do list for the day. Number one, be evil. Number two, take over the world. Like, did he really find an actual list where Lucas had written down things to do today. Number one, negatively affect Dan's reputation. Number two, take credit for all of Dan's success. Like, I don't believe this is real. This sounds like a meme. The same thing we do every night, Pinky. Try to take over the world. There's, like, the way he's writing this is just absolutely insane. Then later he says, I had no idea the extent to which he was plotting against me. I knew Lucas was in a tough spot and empathized with his position. How would you feel if you thought your kid brother was making decisions that affected your financial situation without your approval. I wanted to find a way to work things out. I wanted to get him what he wanted. He's like, I wanted to do right by my brother. I wanted to be a good brother to Lucas, but he was plotting against me. He was waking up every morning writing lists that were like, number one, be evil. Number two, take over Dan's company. Number three, make Dan's life miserable. Like, dude, this didn't happen. There's no way this happened. Then on page 171, Dan starts jerking himself off, like, right there on the page. I'm surprised these pages weren't permanently glued together from how hard Dan jerked himself off all over these pages. So he's talking about Steven, this guy at his company who's giving this speech, and everybody's talking about how great Gravity Payments is and how great Dan is for raising the salary. So it says, after Steven spoke, I assumed the surprise was over and the meeting was coming to a close. But instead, Philip returned to the stage. He presented me with a book containing portraits of Gravity employees along with the notes they had written to me. Several people read excerpts. Prior to Gravity, I spent virtually my entire career working in the nonprofit sector because I thought I wouldn't be able to find for-profit work that aligned with my values. I was wrong. I feel blessed to have found a company that holds true to my values and strives to make a difference each day. As I listened, I could feel my emotions strengthen. I smiled, but mostly in an effort to fight back tears. Alyssa read last. You've been a great leader and an inspiration throughout my time here at Gravity, she began. I'm thankful for the, all the opportunities you've given us. I honestly don't know where I would be if it weren't for gravity. Alyssa went on to explain how her life had changed since the $70,000 policy went into effect. She finished to applause. I reached for the book, but Alyssa held it back from me. I'm actually going to hold on to this, she said, because we have one more surprise for you. And then all the employees bought him a Tesla. And I was like, dude! Dude, where's my car? Where's your car, dude? Can you jerk yourself off harder? First of all, he's like basically advertising his company on this page. He's like, this company has been so good to me. Before I worked here, I thought that there was no for-profit work that could be this good, but working here is so good. And Dan, you are a true leader. Here is my emotions for you. And Dan's just sitting there like, I'm I'm trying to hold back tears. I'm, I'm about to cry. Like, dude, if you jerk yourself off any harder, I'm gonna have to eject you from this book for indecent exposure. I'm gonna end this review of this book with a compliment real quick, which is that I love that the appendix 
appendix at the back of the book has legitimate advice for business owners where it talks about what is a living wage? What can employees do? It has like sections that are just straight up advice about how as a business owner you might try to implement something similar. And while I'm not at a place right now where I can afford to hire full-time employees for my business, which is why I don't do it, if in the future I am in a place where I can do that, I will probably actually consult this for advice along with other things because I thought it was great how he broke this down in specific steps. And, and then I was actually pleasantly surprised on page 237 where there's a part that says, what if you really can't afford to pay people more? You've crunched the numbers and explored every possible option and there is simply no way you can afford to pay your employees $1 more without jeopardizing your business. You are just starting out or run a small business with razor thin margins. Raising your employees wages might not be possible for you right now. Doesn't mean you can't do anything to help your people thrive. Are there other ways you can ease your employees financial burden without increasing their pay? Could you let them work from home to save money on transportation? Could you change their schedules to overlap with school hours so they don't have to worry about childcare? Could you switch to a five hour workday? So it's talking about all of these potential ways to ease up on people's burdens and whether or not it's one of those things where it's like Dan Price I don't trust him but just because he's saying it doesn't mean it's wrong that is a thing that is true that is a thing that is good advice genuinely that like if you can't afford to pay people more try to ease up on their time commitment and things like that if they can work fewer hours you can free them up to be able to do other things that they need then that is a better option than trying to monopolize everyone's time in a full-time job without giving them pay that fairly compensates them for that so some of the things in this book is true like we've said before broken clocks right twice a day. That's an expression we hear a lot. While I don't want to be like Dan Price in the sense that he has exploited women and hurt women, allegedly, allegedly guys, by the way, allegedly, he's not been found guilty in court of any of this yet. But while I think he is a shady character and he's not someone that I trust, when he says things that are true, those things are still true. So I really do think that this book has some good information and it. it does have good parts of telling a story. However, there are parts where Dan seems very self-important and, and he seems to struggle with looking beyond his own perspective of how good things are because of him himself. So he definitely has a little bit of a hero complex in this, which doesn't surprise me with all the things that are happening now. I'm going to have to wait and see what happens with any of the lawsuits that are coming out against him or any of the allegations to see what comes to light over there. But I'm curious your guys' thoughts on this book. It was kind of hard to review because I did have these mixed feelings with thinking certain parts were well written and thinking certain parts had good advice. But on the other hand, knowing that I can't really trust a lot of what he says and that I do think the initial story, the whole inciting incident of going on a hike with his friend, I'm inclined to think that story's bullshit, but that's just my personal opinion. So I'd like to know all your opinions on this in the comments below as well. Do I recommend this book? No, because I don't want Dan Price to financially profit right now because he is a shitty human being and I don't want anyone to do anything to support him. But maybe I can try to make a video or do a blog post or something that shares some of the wisdom from this book. What are your guys' suggestions for that? Because there is some good advice towards the end, but I'm sure if you guys know of other CEOs or not just CEOs, if you know of other like content creators or other writers that I could get similar types of information from who aren't gross abusers, then let me know because I'd rather support them with that. And I'll be on the lookout for those people in the meantime as well. But that was Dan Price's book, which is basically called An Abundance of Red Flags. That's what I'm going to call it. An Abundance of Red Flags and a few pieces of helpful advice because a broken clock's right twice a day. That's Dan Price. I will see you guys again on Monday for another video. Video. In the meantime, keep on supporting ethical small businesses whose employees are not currently alleged to be abusers. Have a good day. Bye. Get you some nuts. There was lots of memes. Makes me wonder if I should pick up lesbianism. Chicago. You guys asked for it.